So hello everyone, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, welcome to my talk. I'm Michał and today I'll be, I'll be speaking about running your Python code in parallel for most part and asynchronous. To be honest, I've never spoken to such a big group of people, so excuse me for being a little bit overwhelmed. And let me advertise other talks a little bit. So you can see that um, asynchronous and parallel topics are hot right now. So even during th this conference, uh, we have several talks about them. Mm. I want you to understand what my talk is about, uh, to, to not mix it with some other talks. I also encourage you to see. Mm. So there are some asynchronous talks, parallel talks. There's also a talk about Python at CERN, which I think will be interesting, or I, I, I think it's a poster session. And this talk tries to be an overview of the topic. So it's not an introduction. That's why I labeled it as advanced. And also you might feel that uh, I've skipped some parts. And, but I wanted to put, uh, to, to put it together as an overview so you can later research what's interesting for you and to uh, not bug you with a lot of detail, details. Okay, so a few words about me. So I worked at the LHCB experiment at CERN, looking for antimatter for some time. And later, I decided to pursue a PhD in computer science. But then I've heard that if I drop out, I will probably start a multi-billion dollar business. But for some reason, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, yes, and currently I work at Akamai, and I'm now as a FAT developer, where FAT obviously stands for frameworks and tools. So what my job is at Akamai is to make sure that we use the best tools we can. And uh, how, how do you define the best tools? So sometimes you hear that Facebook is using some tools or that Google is using some other but do we need that? Do we have the exact same scenario as them? So my job is to create tools and to select tools which are the best fit for us. And Akamai itself uh, is a content delivery, delivery network and cloud service provider. So we are not very known in Europe for some reason, but we have one of the largest or the largest a network of computers uh, talking with each other. And we are also responsible from between 10 to 25% of all web traffic. Uh, we also have some security project, uh, security pro products launched recently. And we also have 16 offices in EMEA, both sales and engineering. Okay, there's a lot of mess when it comes to basic concepts in asynchronous and parallel programming, so let me clarify some th things first. So when you have one pipeline and one worker one working on it, you have a serial or sequential execution. When you have also one pipeline but multiple workers and they do they work in the same time but not in parallel, I would call it concurrent. You may not agree with me, and some people do not, but let's assume, at least for, for this talk, that it's correct. And also, we have parallel execution. So we have multiple pipelines, we have multiple workers, and they actually do their things in parallel. Um, so the concurrency, uh, I usually, uh, when I think of concurrency, I usually think about preemption. Uh, how many of you know what preemption is? Okay, uh, half of you. So let me just say that preemption occurs if a thread has a CPU time and uh, operating systems scheduler decides that there's some other thread that needs that time more. So there the preemption 
occurs, one threat is being stopped, the other threat is being put into his place, and, they, and then they switch roles until their job is complete. So this is why you can sometimes see that things are uh, concurrent because you achieve results in a certain amount of time, but they are not tr truly parallel. Okay, so how would you call this? I would call this a headache. Or you might call it parallel and asynchronous. So another thing uh, which I need to clarify is the difference between uh, threads and processes because they are often mistaken or processes are wrongly called bigger threads. So threads are the place where your code is executed. Uh, each, processes, e each process has a thread, and this thread can be scheduled for execution. It can get CPU time, and all threads share a virtual address space and system resources of the process, and they do not share stacks, local variables, and also, uh, but they do share process heap. And process is an execution environment for threads, so it has its address space, it has executable code, it handles system objects, so it, uh, it brings uh, all what's necessary for a thread to run. Um, so I, I, I wanted to clarify that because sometimes people don't know why Gil in Python complicates things. So how it applies to Python. So in Python we, we have multi-threading and multi-processing. And when we talk about multi-threading, we have one process, so this one environment. We have many threads, only one interpreter. And due to Gil, there's a rule which says that in a Python process, only one Python bytecode instruction is executing at once. So if you have many threads, you cannot execute many bytecode instructions from different threads at once. Um, but um, with I.O., it's a little bit different story because if you have I.O., uh, then it does not execute any bytecode instructions. So if, if you have threads and you do some I.O. in them, you can actually see speed up. But that's because it's not going through Python interpreter. And when we talk about multiprocessing, we have many processes. We have many threads, at least one thread per process. We have many interpreters, and all threads have their own interpreter. And that's why they can execute in parallel. Uh, so do we have Alex Martelli here? OK, not. It's always dangerous to be citing someone sitting in front of you. So during a chat with Raymond, Raymond Hettinger, he proposed the following classification, which I think is simple but nice. So if you have one core, you usually want to run a single process with a single thread. So for 2 to 16 cores, because that's how many cores you can get in consumer PC, PCs nowadays, uh, you can have multiple threads and multiple processes. So why you should not use multiple threads on a, re on a single core? That's because even though that I.O., which might give you a speed up, when it's done in, in a thread, it still needs some CPU time. Not a lot, but it does. So with only one core, you, won't, you should not achieve any speed up. And also, when you have 16 plus cores, you usually have multiple CPUs, so you enter the area of distributed computing. And Alex proposes that as the time goes by, the second category becomes less relevant as we are in the era of big data and even one CPU with 16 on or 32 cores is, is, is not enough. I would argue that for some cases like backend work, services, it is. But you can, you can hear more about that in uh, Raymond Hettinger's talk. Okay, so you should have uh, some knowledge about that now. So when I, as a backend developer, 
think of speed up or performance boost, which one I want to use, parallel or, or asynchronous? Parallel, because I want to execute many things at the same time. And, I want, and if I want to gain responsiveness and lower latency, I'm choosing asynchronous. OK, so when running things in parallel is useful? Well, when you have big data sets or complex computations, when you have problems with parallel nature, so-called coarse-grained, or when you have multi-worker applications. IO-bound problems are not a good fit for being parallelized, as they require a lot of IO, which is mostly serial, sequential. And also problems need to be complex enough so that parallel overhead caused by uh, process maintenance, communication, scheduling, synchronization is negligible to what's going on inside the process. Okay, so who knows Amdahl's law? Some of you. Okay, so Amdahl's law says how much speed up you can get when running in parallel. Uh, when you, you, you need to know uh, how big part of your program needs to be sequential. And if you know that, you can uh, approximate how much speed up you can get with uh, a certain number of CPUs. So let's say that we have a task that runs for 10 minutes, but five minutes of that time is sequential work like loading data. So you can see that if you have even an infinite number of CPUs, we can only achieve a speed up of two. Because that second part, if it's really uh, run in parallel, then and that time goes to almost zero, but you still have that five minute time. So, it's, so you really need to know your problem when you start working in parallel programming. And just to give you an example of that, some of you might say that it's a, a really trivial problem, but in order to present you how that works, I had to choose something like that. Um, so here we have a small data set and a really simple operation. We have an input vector of one million elements and we want to calculate uh, outputs which are inputs plus one. So we can run it uh, sequentially and also we can run it in parallel in, in different processes. So how do you think how much the speed up will be? We are running on four cores. Two, four, none. It will actually be slower because the problem is really simple and a data set is small and uh, it's not enough to, uh, to have any gain. And in fact, you actually lose something. And and even uh, for eight cores or more, it gets even more complicated and you get even worse, worse results. Okay, so a common pattern in parallel programming is to put a problem difficult, more difficult by running it in a for loop. So here we have a problem that's 200 times more complicated and how much the speed up will be now? Two, four, almost four. Yeah, so the, the, the speed up comes from using processes, which like I, like I mentioned earlier, we need to have processes in Python to execute truly in parallel. And arithmetic operations go through interpreters, so, so we need separate interpreters. So here we have almost, almost four. Okay, so some, some problems like that have a parallel nature. So here I was easily able to, um, to divide my data set into four, 
subsets, and, I, and the most part of that program is running in, in parallel. So this, uh, this type of thing has a parallel nature. So usually, usually when we talk about parallel na nature, we talk about coarse-grained problems. So if we have a loop of loops, if we have multiple images to process, if we have multiple data sets, or a really big data set, or maybe the data set is not big, but the operations we want to run on it are long. So those problems are coarse-grained. Coarse and, the, and then there you can easily apply uh, parallel programming. But for fine-grained problems, there's a different story. So when you have iteration of a single loop, an image, or a single small, small data set, you should not parallelize that, at least not with a CPU. Because nowadays, we can actually parallelize fine-grained problems uh, with massively parallel ar architecture devices like GPUs because they have really a lot of processing units and their threads are really light. Okay. okay, so in parallel programming, we have different memory architectures and the uh, most known two are shared memory, where each process has its own memory, uh, where uh, each process connects to a shared memory and it works on the same data set. And we also have distributed memory, aka message passing. So we need to pass data to processes and later get that back. That's why it's called message passing. So how to apply them in Python? So for shared memory, we have shared C-type objects. Uh, those are objects created in shared memory and can be inherited by child processes. So if you import multi from multiprocessing value, you can assign what type that value is. You can assign its value in the beginning. And we have also some other, uh, some other uh, types and primitives. So let's see how they behave. So I have two, uh, I have two programs. So the difference is that one uses locking and the, the other one is not. The one on the left does not use locking. So we have shared memory. So all processes have access to the same memory. All they all can in, uh, can read from it and write to it in the same time. So what you, if you do that, uh, they will ac there actually will be some, something called uh, race conditions. So sometimes two or more processes may read the same value. So let's say that at index two, I have value two, and four processes read that and uh, when they read that, they add one to it, so it's three, and then they will four times write that three into the memory. That's why you can achieve this. So when you, when you run the, the left program, you will get different values depending on uh, what's going on uh, in your system, but the, uh, the answer will be wrong. So for shared memory, you always need to use some kind of synchronization. And in this case, I used locking. So here we ensure that only one process can read shared memory at the same time, and only one can write to it. So with that, you get a good result, but what's with the time? You might say that the problem is too small or the data set is too small, but that won't be the case. The case here is when you use locking and you have multiple processes, you in fact get sequential execution because only one process can 
take something from memory, make calculations and write back to it. So your code will either be slower or run uh, more or less at the same time. And believe me that here it's really easy to spot and see and usually we don't have that simple uh, problems. And actually you, you can use something else. These uh, shared C-type objects have their own logs so you can use them. The, uh, the output will be the same but you will not create additional logs. And you need to really keep the number of your logs as slow as possible to not uh, to know what's going on. Okay, so we also have managers in Python which are a hybrid between the shared memory and message passing. So managers are proxies through which child processes can access data and when you create a manager it spawns a new process which communicate through sockets. So actually, if you create, uh, if you type multiprocessing manager, it will create a new process. And you can later give that to, to children of that process, or you can even use it for remote access because it's using a socket. So uh, for distributed memory, the most uh, commonly used tool is PoolMap. How many of you uh, have used PoolMap? Yeah, some of you. So it's really simple and nice. So you just define how many processes you want and you map a certain function and a collection or its arguments and it just runs fine. It's really a high level and nice tool and um, you can simply achieve speed up. So, but you need to remember to always uh, close or terminate your pool and later to, to join it. And if, you, uh, if you're one of that kind that doesn't remember, like me, you can use it as a context manager. And, you'll, and we also have something that uh, looks like message passing more so we also have pipes and queues. So the basic difference is that pipe has only two ends. It's really fast because it's usually using operating system pipes. And queue uh, can have multiple producers and consumers, but you need to have in mind that behind the scenes there are pipes connecting all elements of the network. Um, yeah, so, so pool has some overlooked features because people usually use it like, like this. So they create a pool with numbers of processes and then they just map, uh, map it some function to some, 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 some input. So what you can define is for example, a uh, max task, tasks per child argument when Sometimes your processes grow and consume more and more memory and you want to restart them once in a while. So here you can de define how many tasks should be executed per child until there's a new child. And you also can define a chunk size and I didn't know that until yesterday, I think, because map usually maps uh, one execution to one element. So if, if you have uh, map of uh, four processes and let's say uh, 12, um, uh, 12 inputs, the default chunk size is one. So there will be 12 round trips between the worker and the, and the main process before the result will come back. So you can uh, optimize it with, with that parameter. So you can also define IMAP and IMAP unordered the difference is that IMAP still waits until all uh, processes finish and uh, because when you call map you will get uh, a list with the results. When you call IMAP you will get a generator but you will still need to wait until everything is finished. 
And when you use IMAP unordered, you get what comes, what finishes first. So that's that's useful. And also there there's an approach with apply async. This is what actually going on behind the scenes, but it is discouraged to to use it because maps maps are considered uh, higher level and and better tools. Okay, so we have different models uh, for parallel programming. We have also different models for distributed memory itself. So we have something called worker-based models. So you can have a pre-fork model that Junicoin uses. So you might create your workers beforehand. So you define that your application starts up with four processes or four threads. And that's pre-fork. You can have a worker model where you define during execution how many workers you need. For example, you optimize that to your data set and how, it, how, it, how well it divides. And uh, multiprocessing pool is an example of that. And you also have a hybrid approach. So you can define that number of workers beforehand and later you can scale them dynamically, which is useful when you're working with something like um, a backend server. Okay, so when you, when you want to create an application, a multi-worker application, and let's say that you want to respond to some requests, then you have basically two approaches. You can either use reuse port and reuse other uh, flags for the socket. And I won't really go into details. There's a really nice description on Stack Overflow about that. Uh, but basically, you can create as many processes or threads you want. You can assign the same socket to them. So all those uh, workers can listen uh, what's, what's coming from the socket. But you need to, uh, in, in, in this scenario, you have to ensure logs and synchronization because if you're going to read from all, all those threads, then you'll just get garbage. So in Twisted, there's a really neat way of doing this. So you create uh, a socket, let's say a TCP socket. You spawn uh, child processes and you can later uh, adopt uh, sockets for the uh, for child processes, but the more and this is uh, the approach which you should choose if you really want to tune your performance and if you really want to have access to some low level stuff. And if you don't, you can take a different approach, which is most common, where you have just a single thread uh, reading from uh, from the socket, and this thread is responsible for I/O. And later, it delegates uh, the work to to some other workers through a queue, a, a queue which I which I mentioned earlier. So then you don't have any problems with synchronization and and stuff like that. So up till now, we've talked about uh, so-called intra-node communication. So communication within a single uh, a single CPU or just one one server, but you can also run your code or on multiple machines. So there's uh, there are many libraries. You probably have heard about MPI, which I think is uh, the most commonly used library up to this day uh, when it comes to to scientists. But there are some uh, some other tools. I personally uh, like Scoop, uh, maybe because it has a really nice slogan, but um, it uses zero MQ sockets for communication. It's really similar to multiprocessing pool, and it utilizes SSH connection for execution. So you need to have SSH access to, to the machines you want to run your, your application on and later it connects to, to them sends data and 
executes it. So you can see that it's really, really simple to use that. Okay, so I've, I've encountered some traps and uh, some weird behavior over the years. Uh, so I would like to share that with you. So one possible trap is hyper-threading. So uh, CPUs are often advertised as 16 cores, uh, 32 cores, 64 cores, but how many physical cores you get? Usually half of them. So uh, hyper-threading works in this way that you have a CPU pipeline and you have, let's call them, slots in them. So if you have slots to run two things at the same time on one core, then your two logical threads will run in, in parallel. But if you don't, then they won't. So uh, I had a problem. I had a 12-core Intel Xeon machine uh, with 24 logical cores. And when I ran my computation, which it was a really, a really complex computation, and um, I'm sure that uh, the result is not uh, caused by communication or stuff like that. I achieved these results. So I've heard that Intel uh, is launching a new tool for tuning and profiling Python. So I think it might be interesting to, to work with that. Also, you don't always want to target 100% utilization because if you have four cores, you, have, you prepare four workers, and then you have 10% of each core not used in each CPU epoch. So what you want to do is to just add workers to use that, but you won't gain anything and actually you will lose. Does someone want know why do we lose time here? Because we should utilize that additional spare 10% and it should be faster. Yes, exactly. So we are switching contexts. So the, all processes are fighting for, the, for resources and uh, switching them and copying them for, uh, for different cores uh, is, is a really expensive operation. So don't always target that 100%. Also, uh, there's a funny thing uh, in how pipes are implemented. So uh, pipes, uh, pipes cannot, at least OS pipes cannot send things both ways. So if you define pipe with duplex, you'll actually get a socket. And uh, if sometimes you get a socket and sometimes you get a pipe, and if you take into consideration that they have different buffers uh, defined in, in the kernel, then you, will be, you, you might encounter a situation where sometimes you will be able to send some, something and sometimes not. So that's interesting. And also you have a usual topic, which is deadlocks. So when one process has some resource, a uh, second process has its own resource, and they wait for, for each other, but they do not uh, free their resources, then they will wait forever. And um, do you know how to kill processes and threads in Python? So there's a kill method. So who used kill method? Okay, so you couldn't use kill method because it does not exist, because you cannot kill a thread. It's by design because you might end up in this situation where your thread holds a resource, and when it's killed, other threads will never get it because it's never being freed. So that's why you need to use some different mechanics. And when we are um, uh, at threads, uh, there are some, th there's a common misconception with daemons. So if you have while true or something similar in your thread, it should be a daemon. 
and daemons should not be joined. Once you set up a threat as, as daemon, uh, they should just run as long as their process is running, and the only clean way of stopping them uh, is up to you. So also don't use global variables. Don't define stop equals false and then iterate it unless it, it, it changes because you might never know what will happen and when those threads will be stopped. So the common pattern is to use events and to just send an event in the main thread and uh, to wait for that event in, in worker threads. Okay, so uh, when it comes to parallel and asynchronous, uh, we, we finally reached the topic. Uh, so we have basically two options, the threaded option and the process option, where we, we can define executors, we can submit jobs to them, and basically what you get is futures, and also you can define them as context managers. And you can, uh, run, you, you can run that without starting on the I.O. loop and just get futures, and, or you can use them with I.O. loop, but then you need adapters. And sometimes those adapters work, and sometimes they don't, so you need to be really careful. And also, uh, keyword arguments are not allowed in executors, so you might want to read the pep to know why. If you really need keyword, key, uh, keyword arguments, then use just partial. Also, you can, uh, you can submit several jobs and wait for, them all, for all of them to, to finish. So coming to, to an end, why would you want that? Um, so we, you might want that for long running tasks that might block your IO loop. Uh, so you might want that if you have some code which is incompatible with, with your IO loop and that will most certainly block it, like requests. You cannot use requests with, uh, with any I loop that exists for now. And also if you have some um, running blocking tasks that you want to run in parallel. So what will you get when you use that? Headache. Because running things asynchronously is troublesome. And when you introduce also running it in parallel, uh, it's also troublesome. So you should really know that you need it. Okay, so let me rant for a moment just before I finish. So you all know this gentleman, it's Tim Peters, and he sh said that there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. So where have we gone wrong? We have currently four commonly used IO loops. We can three types of asynchronous calls. So if there are some decisive people in that crowd, let's, let's think how to fix that. Because Python 3 was created in order to clean up some mess which accumulated over the years. And I feel that now we are creating such mess again. Okay, so in summary, Python has a wide variety of options when it comes to parallel and asynchronous pro programming. Sorry. You should really know your architecture when you use parallel programming. You should always test your code before entering parallel concurrent world, so first sequential, then, then parallel. After you enter the concurrency world, you should test it with fuzzing. Uh, I didn't say anything about that, but you can research that. Be aware of any incompatibilities between modules, and I assure you that they do exist. Be sure when you uh, be yeah. Be sure when you should expect awaitable objects in in asynchronous programming and handle them properly. And also, you know, those tools are for us, and they mostly work. And you can create even production code with it if you test it well. So don't be scared to seek out new options and
to boldly go where no man has gone before. Thank you. Hopefully it will be a piece of cake. Yeah. So Thanks. Do we have yeah. some time for questions? Yeah, yeah we have uh, three minutes for questions. Yeah. Okay. Questions for me, Hayao? Oh, oh a lot of many questions. questions. So actually I Be brought something nice from Poland for people who ask the best questions. So. Yes. You mentioned about deadlocks. I am curious about if there is a uh, that library also detect deadlocks uh, in the program, which can appear. Uh, I know that such solutions exist, but I but I don't remember the the names. But you can mostly get that with fuzzing or just testing uh, some unexpected behaviors. In uh, your uh, last slide, you said, uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, incompatibilities between modules. Maybe you can tell something more about that. What, what was your experience? What modules were incompatible? How um, it worked? Okay, could, you, could, could you say that again and, and um, a little bit louder? So on yeah. my last slide. Be aware of any incompatibilities between modules you use. So what were you referring to? <laughs> yeah. The the um, incompatib yeah. ah. incompatibilities. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, we have different IO loops. So, let's say that you want to use Tornado. It has its own IO loop, but you want to also use some process executor, which uh, does not run really well uh, with that without adapters. So what you might to do is to first adapt your program, your, torna your tornado program, to run on async IO, and then run that, th th those executors. And for example, Curio does not work with any other IO loop, so you don't even get any, um, so you don't even get anything to, to connect to them. And uh, yeah, and for example, in Tornado, you should not yield from, you should yield from a coroutine. So there, there's also some in, incompatibility, and that's, that's what I meant. Okay, thanks, Mihao, for your presentation. <laughs>